Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, promises to be a good webinar, this one. Uh, we've got just shy of uh, 600 registered, so, so it promises to be a good one. Um, today's webinar is on behalf of the IOS Logistics and Retail uh, Group, and it's preventing slips and trips. Uh, so we've got a really good guest speaker today, Christian Harris. I'm Lee Bennett, Vice Chair of the IOS Logistics and Retail Committee. Uh, just a couple of headline stats before we, we hand over to Christian, and I do hope I'm not stealing his thunder. Um, according to the HSC, slips and trips account for around 40% of major injuries at work, and slips and trips are the most reported injury to members of the public. Um, so, so obviously, it's a really, really um, strong topic and a really uh, topical uh, uh, discussion point. Uh, we've got Christian Harris today, who has very kindly agreed to join us. Christian is the CEO of uh, Slip Safety Services. Uh, Christian will be discussing the law relating to slips and trips in the workplace and also giving practical advice on how to prevent slips and trips um, using the six sources of slips, which is not, not very easy to say, I must say. Um, so today's your session. Please do, do ask any questions. We've got a chat box um, to, the, to the right of the screen uh, where you can just, just have chat with other members or, or I've got my colleague Amanda who's, who's sat in the background. She's, she's monitoring the chat. We've also got the Q and A at the bottom. So if you put, if you've got any questions for Christian, you can drop them into the Q and A, and then I can ask ask those at the end of the session. So again, th this is your session. Um, it promises to be a, a really good one. So if, if you've got any questions, please do drop them into the chat. Uh, sorry, into the Q and A at the bottom. And if you've just got any general chat or observations, please do drop drop them in the chat box uh, on on the right. Um, this, this webinar is being filmed, so it will be hosted on the IOSH YouTube channel um, probably by the end of the week, but certainly by, the, by next week it will be on the IOSH YouTube channel, uh, should you wish to, to watch it again. Uh, we won't be issuing certificates or anything, but of course you, you, you can obviously log this as CPD. So, excellent. Um, so it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Christian Harris from Slip Safety Services. Christian, are you there? Hi Lee, I'm here, and hi everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining. Uh, welcome. It's a kind uh, kind introduction by Lee there, so hopefully I can live up to that. Well, thanks a lot. Um, as Lee said, going to make this in interactive, so uh, very happy to take questions um, at the end. And uh, you know, if there's any burning questions uh, as I go through, put them in the chat, and Ben uh, from IOSH can can always interrupt me. I don't mind being interrupted with a good question, um, as long as it's something I can answer. So hopefully will be okay on that topic uh, because I should know what I'm talking about, fingers crossed. So um, here's the big message today, which is that you can stop uh, these types of accidents, slips and trips and falls. Um, they can be stopped. Um, I, won't, I won't stop my presentation here, but if you remember one thing, then I think probably it's remembering this, that these aren't inevitable. Um, you can do something about it and uh, that's what we should be doing. And so what I'm going to try and do today is give you some of the tools and the principles and some structures and some methodologies to think about to enable you to do this. So it might seem a bit hard uh, because, as Lee said, you know, these are by far and away the biggest cause of, of accident and injury and claim. Uh, and I'll go into some of the claim statistics later as well. Uh, but to give you a bit of cause for comfort, I'll just say three things. Um, we've seen countless examples of clients achieving at least a 50% reduction in uh, slip and fall uh, trip uh, and fall accidents. So big, big reductions are possible across all sorts of sectors, all sorts of environments. Secondly, uh, as I'll talk about, there's some science that sits behind this as well. So it's not finger in the air. Uh, it's not assumption. Uh, it's not... Um, best guess, it's actually doing things with scientific grounding, uh, being able to measure what you're doing to track that improvement. Uh, and thirdly, as I mentioned, I'm going to give you a proven roadmap of what to do here. Uh, so some principles, uh, some processes, and a few things to have a look at. Uh, and also there's going to be a lot of resources I'm going to give you for free as well. Uh, in terms of me and a bit of my background, uh, so Lee's mentioned the business, uh, but a few quick statistics just so you can hopefully uh, trust that when I tell you these things are possible and I tell you there are proven ways of doing it, uh, that, I, that I kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, so um, 
I love safety and risk so much that I've got a podcast about it. Um, and uh, this week, for example, I interviewed uh, Crystal Danbury, who's the head of safety, risk and insurance for Sainsbury's. Uh, had some other great guests on as well. Uh, as a side note, if anybody's interested in appearing on the podcast and sharing your insights and stories about safety and risk, I'd love to have you on. Just reach out to me. Um, over the years, my team and I have helped over 5,000 client sites dotted around the UK uh, to reduce uh, risk uh, and then had some great success stories, as mentioned. I personally have worked on some quite high profile cases. Uh, so 2015, for example, I got involved in, in this case, which was a, a tragic death of, of, of a, a chap called Stanley May in a co-op store where he slipped and banged his head. Uh, and that was a bit eerie, I can tell you, investigating a, a death after a slip. It doesn't happen that often, but it does happen several times a year. Uh, and um, at last count, when we sort of start totting things up, uh, we uh, as a team have been saving about £10 million of, of claims a year over the last three years. So ten, uh, three of these big, uh, lovely houses somewhere, which uh, I'm sure we'd all... Um, just to settle for one of those, but um, but over the last three years, that's what we've done. And we partner with a number of large organisations and key stakeholders from insurers to brokers to, to lawyers. Uh, I do quite a lot of IR stuff. I do some double IRSM stuff, um, architects, floor suppliers, uh, and various other people as well. So, um, you know, ju just by the company we keep, I guess. Now, um, my big goal in this area of risk is, uh, is to have a big, big impact and reduce the number of uh, slips specifically uh, and falls. And um, this is a, an American football stadium in Michigan. And now that, that looks like a, a large amount of people indeed. Um, but actually, my goal is, is, uh, is a little bit bigger than that. So what I'm trying to get to is half a million of these accidents pre prevented per year around the globe. That's my kind of big mission that I'm on. Uh, and, uh, you know, doing this webinar and doing some of the stuff uh, that we do on a day to day basis and the podcast and various other things uh, are just trying to move step by step closer to that big goal. Um, so if you're interested in joining me on that, uh, on that pursuit, then I'd love to, uh, to partner up with you and, and try and reduce uh, as many of these accidents as we can, because as I said, they are preventable. Uh, so if you'll permit me, before I get into the main content, I just thought I'd give you a bit of background on me and, and kind of why, uh, why I'm so passionate about this. Um, so if you cast your mind back to 2012, uh, the summer just before the Olympics, and I, I lived in London, well, I still live in London, but I lived uh, at this time not far away from the Olympic Park, actually. Uh, and it was a Sunday, uh, 13th of May. And before I got married, uh, life was very different because we've now uh, got kids. And so anyone with kids will know that you don't have lazy Sunday mornings anymore, but back then we did have a lazy Sunday morning. Uh, had a croissant from the local deli and decided it'd be nice to have a trip to Columbia Flower Market in East London, uh, which is like a street market that does flowers and stalls with food and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we had um, bought some flowers, uh, had some nice lunch, had a lovely stroll around. It was quite a nice day. <clears throat> then we hopped in the car and headed back home and uh, wanted to pop into pick up a Sunday Times and a few groceries at Sainsbury's in Islington. So uh, we parked the car, uh, turned the corner and started walking down this street because the entrance to the store is, is just around the corner there on the right and the car park is, is behind us here. Um, and that's the last thing that I remember for several hours because unbeknownst to me, because I have a total blackout of this situation, uh, a car sped around that corner uh, going far too fast, lost control, sort of wobbled and, and, and twisted and turned a bit and mounted the curb and ploughed into me, and ran me over. Um, so this was me uh, a few hours later, not looking my best in, in hospital. Um, obviously, it could have been much worse because I'm still here to tell the tale, but I suffered some pretty bad injuries, um, broken collarbone and wrist and uh, neck damage and and cuts and bruises and scars and all sorts of things. Um, so not a very nice Sunday, uh, but obviously what that did teach me, I guess, was you know that accidents can happen when you don't expect them uh, and they can happen uh, when they're not your fault and they can be really serious. And so 
I, uh, I guess I have a, you know, an appreciation for what it's like to, to suffer um, in an accident. And therefore, you know, when you know that, you, you don't want that happening to other people because no amount of money uh, in the world, uh, particularly under the UK legal system where there aren't any punitive damages, um, was enough to, to compensate me for, for what happened. And so, um, you know, my mission ever since then uh, has been to try and make an impact in, uh, in stopping things like that from happening to other people. So we'll just uh, look a bit at slips versus trips versus falls. Um, I'm going to concentrate on slips uh, today for a few reasons. Um, if we think about trips, there are three key components in the trip triangle. Um, so you've got housekeeping, walkways, as in floors, and design and maintenance. Now, all of these are fairly basic things. Um, there's not much science to this. Um, and uh, you know, I'd be really teaching grandma to suck eggs if I started talking to you about uh, moving cables and, and things like that. Whereas getting into into trips, uh, into slips, sorry, it's, there's a lot more to it, which we'll which we'll touch upon um, quickly. When it comes to falls, obviously this particular fall is a fall from a ladder, which is a bit different. But <clears throat> lots and lots of falls are actually uh, caused by slips or trips. Even falls at heights are often caused by slips or trips. So. Um, <clears throat> One of the key things that we try to get people to do is to really drill down into their data and understand, you know, are they having a problem with slips or, or is it trips or is it falls? Because um, quite often people just bundle these together and fundamentally there are huge differences uh, in, in what are causing these, these incidents. So if you've got a problem with trips because you've got uneven pavements, you know, getting a slip test, <clears throat> for example, is not going to do much good. Uh, conversely, you know, if you've got people uh, slipping over, going around with a pound coin and checking the um, the height of any uh, curbs or, or, or things like that is, is not going to be helpful either. So getting to the bottom of what's actually happening uh, is really, really important. Um, a bit of uh, additional evidence just to support this point. Um, if we look at AXA Insurance, who we work with, um, there's a, an article on their website <clears throat> sharing their claims data in the UK. And the biggest cause of claims for them is slips. Uh, and it's actually not on this chart. So I forgot to put the number on, uh, but they spend 80, 80 million pounds a year uh, on slips. Manual handling is their second biggest cause of claim, which is 30 million. So less than half of, uh, of the number of slips uh, and trips <clears throat> isn't, uh, isn't sort of published because it's a much, much lower uh, number. Um, another piece of data, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at the claims uh, within the retail sector, the insurance claims, uh, sub 25k, so these are portal claims, if you're familiar with the uh, insurance claims portal, um, slips is 20%, trips is 9%, so again, twice as many slips than trips uh, when it comes to, um, uh, to retail claims as well. And if we think about this by plotting a very simple uh, a chart of kind of the size of the problem and the complexity of the problem, um, you know, the, the slips piece is, is more complex and is a bigger problem. So that's where we, uh, we tend to focus on time. So uh, when it comes to slips then, and by the way, I took this photo myself on a, on a, a, a Friday evening coming home through a station in London. I think that's gone slightly overboard there. Um, there are four big problems that, that we have <clears throat> that I think we need to confront and uh, they make up uh, an acronym. I'm a big fan of acronyms as you'll, you'll get to, to hear. Um, the SLIP problem. So let's just run through those to uh, set the scene a bit. So um, the first problem that we hear a lot is, you know, SLIPs are simple. So S for SLIP, simple. Um, what does that sound like? Well, um, you know, <clears throat> just stick a sign out it's fine, you're covered. Um, or we clean the floor, the floor looks clean. We've got an anti-slip floor, doesn't matter. It's that kind of simplistic, uh, superficial thinking. Um, so I'd be interested to know as we go through these four problems, you know, have you ever found yourself thinking any of these kinds of thoughts? Uh, or probably more likely, um, have you ever heard anybody, you know, in your business or in another business, um, 
making comments that kind of chime with, with what I'm saying here. I'd be interested to, to know. So the reality is that slips are much more complex than people think. Uh, so signage alone is not an adequate control was a quote from Cornwall Council uh, in response to the Stanley May <coughs> uh, death that I mentioned. They said that um, retailers, particularly supermarkets, um, I'm, I'm thinking of the exact quote, uh, this, this, this case should serve as a warning that signage alone is not an adequate control. Um, floors should either be uh, closed off from public use when they're wet, or they should be safe to walk upon when they're wet. Spillage control isn't enough either, because if you think about it, yes, the vast majority of floors aren't routinely wet, but some floors, you know, 5% perhaps of floors, are getting routinely wet uh, or contaminated. It's impossible uh, to keep them dry, and therefore, you know, saying we're, we're dealing with this through spillage control is, is no good. Uh, and cleaning records alone aren't enough either, because many floors are, are slippery, irrespective of how you clean them. The second thing that we hear a lot is slips are low cost. So what does that kind of sound like? Um, this is a good one we hear a lot. It's OK, our insurance will cover it. Slips aren't expensive anyway. Um, how many times have you heard it's OK, our, ins our insurance will cover it? Because people don't really seem to understand how insurance works. Um, in reality, slips are more costly than, than most people think. So I mentioned the AXA. Uh, 80 million a year of claims. The average claim costs 10,000 um, pounds. <throat> interestingly, slips is the biggest cause of people going to A&E every year, 300,000 people, um, and one and a half million uh, bed days uh, are caused from that. So a big, big strain on the NHS. There are criminal fine costs. So there have been a number of 100,000 pound plus fines, including the co-op uh, case that I mentioned. Tesco was fined uh, £733,000 in early 2020 after a man slipped and broke his hip in one of their stores. Um, but of course, there are also all of these hidden uninsured costs as well. Um, HSE uh, has their accent iceberg and they say between eight and 36 times the claim cost. So, you know, if you've got a £10,000 claim, you might have 80,000 of, of, of um, bottom line costs on top of that. So actually, slips are neither inexpensive because you know that's a big amount of money uh, nor does your insurance cover a lot of the costs that are incurred i is you know slips are impossible to prevent you know you can't stop slips they're always going to happen that's kind of what it sounds like whatever you do you're bound to get these accidents again uh, flawed thinking The reality is that <clears throat> I've seen countless examples of, of very significant reductions in uh, accidents and in injuries and in claims across all sorts of sectors, you know, even in environments like swimming pools, even in uh, areas like bathtubs, even in busy uh, places like train stations. So it is possible to reduce these, uh, these accidents and stop them from happening. Um, I'm not saying <clears throat> we can eliminate accidents. Uh, we have seen that happen before, but I'd never ever uh, promise anybody that they can do that, but you know, make a big, big dent in the problem. And lastly, we, we, we hear that slips are poultry. Um, by that we mean, you know, um, loads of people slip over, but very few get hurt. It's not that really, it's not really that serious. Um, but actually, you know, we, we, the reality is that um, we have deaths like Stanley May, we have uh, this example, Irina, um, we have people getting amputated, uh, having um, limbs amputated. That happens about a dozen times a year. We have concussions. We have 90% uh, of, of serious slips lead to broken bones. So yes, <clears throat> there are lots and lots of slips that happen without serious injury. But as we said, there are 300,000 people a year going to A&E uh, after a slip. And that doesn't include people who, you know, perhaps may... Um, slip and <clears throat> fracture something, but not. But maybe they feel like they've sprained it, so they just go to the doctor rather than uh, the GP rather than A&E. So you know, there's big, big numbers here. Uh, and, and all these four challenges, I suppose, lead to this vicious circle where we just carry on doing the same old stuff. We carry on looking at this quite superficially. Uh, we carry on uh, assuming that we can't do anything about it. And so we get 
the same results over and over again. So as Lee said, about 40% of workplace accidents, a third of, of insurance claims by volume and value, uh, and, and, and it just kind of goes on. Um, good news is there is a better way forward. So that's what we're going to start delving into now. And um, as well as acronyms, um, I like alliteration. So uh, there's a few T's to remember here. So uh, remember, remember the slip problem, remember lots of T's, and then there's another couple of things to, to remember as well. So the first T is, uh, I'm cheating here a little bit, but it's the bridge. So uh, we talk a lot about, you know, there's this, uh, the big challenge at the moment now is, you know, we're having these accidents, people feel uh, for whatever reason, they can't do anything about it or they're trying their best, it's not working. Um, but actually there is uh, this proven method of, of crossing that bridge and getting from, uh, from, from that situation to some of the outcomes that we've shared before. Uh, the next uh, key idea is uh, to tune your chimes. So uh, chimes is an acronym that, uh, that I devised. And this is basically the six reasons that people slip. So these are the key principles to remember and the key things to think about whenever you're uh, considering how to reduce the risk of slips and falls uh, in your uh, buildings. So I'll run through this with you because um, this is quite good. This is good stuff. And one of the things I'm going to point you to is a series of videos where we delve into each of these in, in more detail and give a real life um, example of, of them as well to kind of bring it to life a bit. Um, but C is for contamination. So in order for someone to slip, there has to be some kind of contamination on the floor um, <clears throat> because a clean and a dry floor surface is almost impossible in, in a practical sense to slip on. So to what extent can we control that contamination? To what extent can we better understand that contamination? Uh, to what extent can we withstand a certain amount of contamination before uh, the risk of a slip becomes uh, acute? These are the sorts of questions uh, that we should be asking. What is the contamination um, and what's the best way of, of dealing with it? H is for heel. Uh, so again, in order for a slip to happen, a foot needs to be involved, otherwise it's not a slip. Uh, so to what extent can we control the footwear that people are sporting when they're walking on our floors? Uh, and as you'll appreciate, that's going to be easier for members of staff than members of the public. <clears throat> what does a safety shoe mean? Uh, does a safety shoe mean slip resistance or not? Um, spoiler alert, it, it probably doesn't in many cases. Um, so there's a difference between a a safety shoe and a slip resistant shoe. Individual, so these are all the human factors. So um, if you think about walking on a flat surface in a straight line at a normal speed versus if you are uh, rushing, uh, if you're twisting, turning, pushing, pulling, carrying things, these are all going to increase your requirement for friction in order to walk safely. Um, if you think about being distracted, um, you know, we're all glued to our phones uh, nowadays, for example, and you're not going to see a hazard um, like, a, like a spillage, for example. That's going to mean you're probably more likely to, uh, to slip and fall uh, rather than avoid having a, a, an accident in the first place. And obviously, if you're distracted, um, we can all self-address. So we can all walk on, uh, on a sheet of ice without slipping, but we, we walk in a very careful way uh, and we... Um, balance, you know, judiciously and so on and so forth. Whereas if you're distracted, um, this thing happens in an instant. You can't self-recover uh, to avoid actually falling and having an accident. Maintenance is the M in chimes. So that splits into three things. Um, change of use. So um, think about repurposing of, of, of stores or repurposing of warehouses and, and perhaps you're storing um, I don't know, uh, tires in one area and you're storing uh, some kind of liquid in another area. Um, you may have the, the floor surfaces in the, in the area where you're storing liquid uh, of, a, of a different type to withstand some level of liquid on the floor, but then you decide for some reason to swap the storage around and all of a sudden the liquid is on the floor surface that isn't designed to be wet. Uh, wear and tear is the second one. So thinking about um, a church is a good example. 
uh, go to any any church and you'll see that wear and tear will change floors over time and that will have an effect on their uh, slip resistance so it could be that they're roughened over time in which case they might be more slip resistant or it could be that they've become smoother over time and therefore they're less slip resistant and the third aspect of maintenance which is really important is cleaning so all floors are cleaned um, many floors are cleaned every day but is that cleaning effective how do we know if it's effective uh, and cleaning actually can be the difference between um, a floor that is um, slip resistant and, and safe when wet according to the the HSE definition of that which we'll talk about um, continuing to be safe or not and just because a floor looks clean doesn't necessarily mean that it is clean so think about covid um covid has has brought to the to the front of our minds the fact that there's there can be contamination on the surface that we can't see um, and a floor can be exactly the same and that contamination can cause floors to become slippery environment <clears throat> so this is all about the built environment around us so steps stairs slopes lighting handrails things like that uh, but also the environment from the perspective of uh, the weather so you know um, Manchester versus Mauritius for example how often is it going to rain and, and how heavily will it rain uh, but also things like um, condensation which is quite a big problem that, that often crops up and then S is for surface so to what extent is the floor surface slip resistant um, and you can't tell just by looking at a floor uh, if it's safe um, because I've seen so many floors over the years that are textured and people assume that they're safe um, but actually they're not so these are the principles you need to look at uh, and, and consider when you're doing a, a risk assessment so it's all about understanding these then thinking about what which are controllable and when uh, and and then what can you do about it <clears throat> now we might just leave the questions to the end but th this is probably a topic where <clears throat> there might be some specific questions but as i say one of the three resources that um, we're going to offer you is a deep dive into all of these areas so tune your chimes. Uh, the next T is test your floors. So I don't know who's seen one of these before, but this is called a pendulum test. Uh, this is a uh, slip resistance test that is used both by the HSE in criminal prosecutions and in uh, enforcement uh, action. And it's also used by lawyers and insurance companies in court cases. Uh, what it does is it mimics the uh, the act of, of someone slipping so it mimics the the heel striking a floor and as you'll see um, it, it's called a pendulum because it swings and as it swings through it pushes a pointer to this gauge which is on the left hand side of the machine and that gives you a number so I'll just show this show you this in use so what you'll see is the heel come down strike the floor swing through and then you'll see that pointer uh, is on that gauge and that gauge is telling you the level of slip resistance on the floor. I'll just show it to you again, because it is, it is a quick clip. So we're gonna spray the floor, release the foot, foot strikes the floor, swings through, and uh, gives you a number on the gauge. So that is a way of scientifically, uh, in line with how the HSE does it, measuring how safe your floors are. So you don't need to assume uh, that, you know, it's a smooth floor, it's slippery, or it's a textured floor, it's not slippery, or it's it's clean therefore it's not slippery you can actually test and just double check and have that certainty so the output of the test is a number uh, you get three categories of risk um, high moderate and low traffic light system uh, and then we can further take the uh, ptv and correlate that to an accident risk exposure so uh, if you're anything like me you want to be up on this right hand side uh, where you've got a, a pendulum test value, a PTV of 36 plus, and that gives you an accident risk exposure of one in a million. <clears throat> Whereas if you're down towards the left-hand side uh, with a PTV of 24, you've got a one in 20 risk exposure. So it's the difference between uh, rely, having to rely as a building owner or operator on only one in a million people having to do something themselves to avoid that slip from taking place, uh, versus relying on one in 20 people. This doesn't mean that, you know, if you get uh, 20 people walking through, one of them will slip. Um, <clears throat> it means that one in one of those people um, statistically will 
have to do something themselves to self-address in order to slip. So there's an exposure risk of one in 20. <clears throat> and basically what we're trying to do is to help people to firstly understand where they are uh, and then secondly move up further to the right on this scale. Um, why do we need to test floors? So, um, you know, uh, here's an assumption that people often make. An anti-slip floor is a safe floor. So this is a very anti-slip floor in a, in a leisure facility. Um, but if you look at that and you see that actually this floor is very, very dirty, um, then you slip test the floor. You discover that as we found that floor, the, uh, the potential for slip when it was wet was, was actually high. Uh, but once it was effectively cleaned, going back to the, uh, the M in chimes, maintenance, um, it had a low risk. So that is an anti-slip floor. It is a safe floor when it's wet. Uh, but only if it's maintained and, and cleaned and looked after well. Um, basically, if you don't clean these floors, you get a, a, a layer of contamination between the foot and the floor, and your foot is going to slip uh, on that floor, on that uh, layer of contamination. So by making uh, by testing the floors, you can understand better the risk, <clears throat> and therefore you can do stuff to make uh, the risk lower. The second reason. Uh, and I mentioned we work with a number of, of, of lawyers that defend insurance claims, is that if you've got uh, slip testing data which proves you're being proactive and proves you are taking this seriously and proves that your floors uh, are safe when wet, then even uh, you know a slip around a swimming pool, which is the context of this comment from David Scott of the Kios, if you can produce that evidence, you should, you should expect to defend a claim. So even if someone slips, even if it's on a swim pool, even if the floor was wet, if you can prove, if you've got that evidence to prove that your floors at a regular, you know, periodic point in time uh, were safe, you've discharged your duty of care uh, and, and, and you should be able to defend that claim. Without the evidence, it's more, much more difficult. Uh, and then another, another T is just trusting the process. So Lee mentioned this at the outset. This is our six-step method that we, that we walk through with clients. Uh, feel free to, to pilfer this and use it uh, yourself. Um, measuring, understanding, so doing that testing. There's other testing that can be done as well. Footwear, cleaning, testing, and other things, getting some quantification, building up that understanding of chimes, and then going into this kind of continuous improvement cycle, improve, maintain, monitor, improve, maintain, monitor, and then evidencing so that you defend claims and that you know what's going on. Uh, and then finally, take the scorecard. So we've developed a uh, digital diagnostic tool called the Slip Safety Scorecard. Uh, this basically takes five minutes to complete. You answer a series of yes, no questions. Um, it takes about five minutes and it will give you a score uh, for each of the areas of chimes. So you get a percentage for each area of chimes and you get an overall percentage. So you can score yourself for where you're strongest and where you've got room to improve. You get a 30 page report uh, and you get personalized recommendations as well. And then everybody that does this um, has the opportunity to book in for a 15 minute uh, consultation with me on Zoom to chat through the results. So you get you know, a better understanding of where you are now, where you can improve. We can then chat it through uh, and go into a bit more uh, detail. So. That's how to uh, one of the things to, to, that I recommend you do. So what is that? If you can get hold of this, uh, grasp this, grasp the metal, uh, get follow that process, tune your chimes, test your floors, do all that good stuff. What happens? Well, my experience is in the short term, almost immediately, uh, you can start to reduce the risk of accidents and kind of see uh, some of these improvements that we mentioned before. In the more medium term, <clears throat> there are some interesting benefits around insurance. So uh, one of the podcast episodes I did was with a guy called Chris Gill, and we talked about um, insurance risk management bursaries, which is something of a hidden secret, but it's basically getting insurance companies to fund safety uh, improvement works. Uh, <clears throat> so we've seen that a lot. A lot of our work is funded like that. But I've also even seen uh, things like... <clears throat> Uh, reductions in premium of £65,000, uh, a big company, of course, to, to have a reduction of 65000 but uh, just by doing some slip testing and just by starting this process off, without even having the proven results of the reduction of accidents, 
Uh, we've seen premiums being reduced from insurers uh, there as well. And then in the long run, um, I talk about these four P's. So um, if you can achieve this feeling of safety, this feeling of security, this feeling of protection uh, among your staff, uh, that drives higher performance within the business, uh, both, you know, uh, people working uh, more efficiently and effectively, but also staying with you longer um, and, and reducing, you know, turnover of staff and things like that. That's clearly going to drive profitability. And, and, and if you can get to that point where you've got a, a, high, um, a team that feels uh, safe and secure, that's performing well, that's producing profit, that gives the business the power to do more meaningful things in the world. So that could be expanding and growth. It could be developing new products. It could be doing charitable and social uh, um, impacts as well. Um, and so, you know, safety, and I know you guys get this because you're all safety professionals, but actually safety should be fundamental in the business and trying to draw the line between safety and profit and then what goes after profit is really, really important. So um, if you're interested in, in getting uh, involved in, in, in achieving some of those outcomes, like we mentioned, um, here's what I'd suggest. Um, do take the scorecard. Um, so go to our website, take the scorecard. It's only five minutes, as I say. Uh, let's jump on a Zoom and we can chat about some of your uh, requirements and go into some of the detail, you know, that really applies to you beyond the principles. You know, the principles are uh, constant, uh, but obviously below that is a lot of detail and depth. Um, and in exchange for that, um, I've bundled together, pulled together uh, a huge raft of free stuff, basically, um, that um, all of these different companies, um, some, some leading brands in, in safety um, and, and, and cleaning and, and, and footwear and various other things have, have agreed to give uh, to you guys. So for everybody on this webinar, uh, everybody that takes the, the, the scorecard, um, there's a thousand pounds worth of, of free stuff. Uh, that you can take away um, in addition to uh, having done the scorecard and got the report and, and all of that stuff. So um, I'd certainly encourage you to, uh, to, to, um, to take part and, and benefit from this, even um, weekly winter weather forecasts and alerts for your sites. You know, how, how cool is that, that technology allows us to do that now? Um, there's a product there, Fresh Check, which uh, you can spray onto a surface and it'll, it'll show you if it's clean or not. So does it look clean or is it really clean? Um, there's some really interesting stuff around safety footwear from V12, um, some great software, some discounts and various other things. So a big bundle of stuff that you can benefit from there. So summing up then, and I think I'm pretty much on time um, to try to kind of get the essence of this. I suppose you've, you've heard my backstory and you've heard hopefully the, the, the passion that I've got for, for this subject. And, I suppose what I'm really known for is something that not many people uh, kind of want to talk about in, in many ways, which is I just want to make people feel safer. Um, and I've got that big goal of, of reducing the number of, of slip and fall accidents by half a million. Um, but actually, at, at a much more granular level, you know, just thinking about you um, watching this webinar, joining in, you know, I, I, what I would hope is that uh, having learned some of this stuff and, and going away and, and, and uh, benefiting from some of these free resources that you're going to feel safer because you've got more knowledge um, you've got some frameworks you've got some principles you've got some resources that you can go and implement in your business and have that kind of immediate impact so you're going to actually feel safer and, and be able to sleep easier at night and have more confidence that you can start to tackle this problem uh, in, a, in a better uh, and in a more scientific way and that in turn will have the impact of making your wider teams feel safer because they'll get a sense of this, they'll feel it themselves, they'll see it. Uh, and that will also have a knock-on effect on, on your clients and your supply chain and, and so on as well. So that's really what this is all about for me. Uh, it's about making the world um, a, a safer place. So that's it in terms of my slides. Um, I can see there have been some questions coming in. Um, all I'd say is, uh, you know, do uh, take advantage of the of the offer of all those resources. Uh, take the scorecard, and then we can hop on a call and, and have a chat and uh, and see if we can help you to to make some improvements in in this space um, at a, at a granular level that's that's bespoke to you. Thank you, Christian. Um, brilliant. I mean, great timing. Twelve uh, forty minutes. Uh, yeah, excellent. Well done. 
I, I, we've had lots of engagement in, in the in the Q and A and in the chat. Um, just before we go into that, could could I just um, ask you in relation to your uh, car accident, um, and and this can be relatable to slips and trips. How did that accident impact on your day to day life? So things that you like activities that you were, you could no longer do, holidays, family life, school runs, etc. How, how did that impact on you? Uh, which can also be related to slips and trips. Yeah, so so pretty profoundly. Um, I mean, I was uh, I went to hospital for a night, and then I went home, but then I had to go back into hospital to have an operation. So I've got a I've got a plate in my in my collarbone, uh, for example, and 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 then I had you know a series of uh, of other medical interventions and physio and, and things like that. Um, I guess it took me, it took me about a month to kind of get back up on my feet again. And then it probably took me about another three months until I was, I would say, kind of 90% back to normal. Um, but I still have um, issues with my wrist, you know, um, like I, I love playing snooker. That's my one of my pastimes. And if anybody's played snooker, you sometimes have to bridge over the ball in front of you. And I, even if I do that, I, I have like a weakness and a sort of thing in my wrist <clears throat> um so a, a few months but then i suppose actually what was interesting was the psychological side of things um because it took a lot lot longer than that i mean i'm still now very very conscious of the speed of cars as i'm walking along the pavement um but it i wouldn't say i was scared but it took me a long time to sort of have a, a level of comfort where i was not um overly sort of thinking about about that so you know, whilst I still have um, some physical challenges, um, you know, it is what it is to that to some extent. But the psychological stuff actually was was um, was was probably for longer. And I would actually say that arguably the bigger uh, psychological hit was on my girlfriend at the time, now wife, because she was stood next to me. I don't remember that. I don't remember it at all. I have a total blackout still. You know, ten years later. But she you know, she remembered it. She was having to relive it, and she was having to care for me and look after me as well. So, you know, it was it's <clears throat> anything like this is people. Um, one of the um, one of the challenges I think we face as a, as a wide profession, not not health, not necessarily health and safety IOSH member type people, but if we think about risk broad more broader, more broadly, sorry, <clears throat> when we think about sitting in a board meeting or or speaking to insurers or whatever. It, we get down to pounds and shillings quite quickly, but we often forget that it's the human uh, fact that, that, you know, that's where the real cost lies. Um, I mean, that was exactly my point. I mean, a lot of people, they see slips and trips as inevitable and, well, you, you, you've slipped, you, you've, you've got bruised, you get on with it. But, but some of the more serious slips, uh, you're right, you touched upon, I'm aware uh, of a woman that, that slipped. It was a quite innocuous slip. Um, and she had uh, several operations and she had ended up having a, a, a leg amputated below the knee. So, you know, the, these can result in, in very, very serious injuries. Yeah, and it's it's all down to luck as well, or bad luck, because, you know, you, you or I, Lee, could, could slip in exactly the same place, in exactly the same way, but we might just fall ever so slightly differently. And, and actually, you know, I fall onto my elbow and actually I'm okay, whereas you fall onto your wrist and you break your wrist, you know, or you fall and bang your head and, and I don't, you know, so a lot of it is, it, it is down to the, the bad luck for those unfortunate people um, that, that, that do suffer. But, you know, it's, the problem is obviously, if you think about it, you're more likely to slip on a, a harder surface. And obviously if you fall onto a harder surface rather than falling onto a softer surface, you're more likely to break something. Yeah, um, yeah. If you break your wrist, that's one thing, but if you smash your head, um, you know, that's another thing entirely. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you'll indulge me for this for this next mm -hmm. section, please. Um, I, used, I used to work in, in enforcement, regulatory enforcement. And when I used to talk to people about slips and trips, I, I used to get these questions asked to me. And, and I'm sure you will have heard them yourself. So please do indul indulge me. I, yeah. I do know the answers, but I'm hoping that you can share your, your experiences and answers uh, with the audience. So I'm not, I'm not putting you on the spot there. I'm not trying to trip you up or anything. But guaranteed you will have heard every one of these questions yeah. as I did uh, when I worked in, in that role. Um, so if I have a slip test carried out and somebody slips, is this a smoking gun? 
Well, I would suggest that it could be a smoking gun if you have a slip test done and it shows you've got a problem and it's in a part of a building where, um, you know, with a risk assessment based approach, you, you probably should confront that problem and you don't. Um, but conversely, there's a smoking gun there for not doing the, the testing and not looking into it properly as well. So I always talk about, you know, there's a difference, there's a line in the sand between uh, 95% of, of floors probably that are not foreseeably wet or contaminated and there you don't need to go into that much detail you know keep floors clean and dry and, and you're probably fine have good spillage control and then there's the five percent which are the entrances the toilets the kitchens you know the swoop the swimming pools etc that the external areas that are going to get wet they are going to get contaminated um, and so you know my uh, my suggestion my experience based on where I've seen enforcement, my experience based on uh, law, law cases and insurance claims is that you should be going to a level of detail that's a bit deeper in those areas. And that's where, you know, you should be getting some testing done and acting on the, re acting on the results of that testing, um, not sitting on your hands. But as David Scott said, um, even in those areas, <clears throat> if you've got the testing and you've got the good results, then you can defend the claim because you're, that's proof that you are discharging your duty of care. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and you're right, um, not having the test is, is a smoking gun in itself because I can guarantee if there's a serious uh, incident, serious slipping incident, either the HSC or the local authority, they're going to be using the pendulum test on your floors. Yeah. So if, if that test comes out as, as high slip potential, then you're in real, you're on a real sticky wicket. If, if it's an area that is likely to get, yeah. <clears throat> you know, it, it, I mean, <clears throat> the Tesco example uh, of the 733,000 fine, um, you know, that was in an area of the store, um, as, as I understand it, that I would suggest is not likely to get wet. So that wasn't necessarily the fact that the floor was slippery. It was down to other things that they didn't do around cleaning and, and maintenance and whatever. Um, you know, if, if, if that person had slipped and Tesco were able to prove that, you know, the floor was dry and then literally five seconds before he slipped, somebody spilt something on the floor, they never, in my opinion, wouldn't, wouldn't have been fined. Um, but, it, you know, yeah. so the slip resistance of the floor is, is, is relevant, but it's more relevant in, in those uh, foreseeably wet or contaminated areas. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll probably come across as a bit of a nerd by saying this, but um, there is a, a, a test case, a legal test case, uh, Ward versus Tesco, 1976, yeah. where they, uh, their, their defence was that they regularly uh, swept, swept the floors and cleaned the floors up to five times a day. Uh, that was the defence of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the business. Um, and the judge found that they, they were unable to uh, state, uh, prove and demonstrate that there was a clear and efficient system in place for slips. So um, the, the company were found liable and that uh, for, the, for the health safety people on the, on the call was interested. That is uh, Ward versus Tesco, 1976. Yeah. Um, another question, and, and please do indulge me. These, these are ones that I just remember being asked. So I, right. I hope you can. Uh, um, do I have to carry out a slip test in a wet area, such as a swimming pool changing room? Because obviously it's going to be slippery, isn't it? Well, it, uh, no, it's not. It's not obviously going to be slippery because um, you know. Uh, think about if you if you operate a hotel, um, and in your lobby you've got a marble, a shiny marble floor, and in your kitchen you've got an industrial resin floor. Well, if if your assumption is it's bound to be slippery, then why wouldn't you put the marble into the kitchen? So um, it's bound to get wet. It's bound to be more slippery uh, when it's wet than when it's dry. But there are going back to the testing, there are parameters which are set in the law about what constitutes an acceptable level of, of risk. And so, yes, it's bound to get wet, but therefore that would, to me, argue that you should be getting the testing done so you know how safe it is when it's wet and then you can try and do something to, to make it achieve uh, that, that benchmark. 100%. Have you ever thought of going into enforcement? Because you've got all the, all the answers and all the... Uh, all, all the... Perhaps I should. Lines. Perhaps yeah, I should. should. Yeah. I'll, I'll, most people go the other way, but perhaps I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll do the reverse. Uh, I, no comment. Um, I, I mean, I work in a retail environment. Um, um, personally, where I'm sat now is a large, uh, large retail mm -hmm. environment. Um, another question. I. This is a hypothetical question, but it's one that's been asked to me before. 
I can't prevent customers from spilling food and drink. So what's the point in having a slip test? So I've guessed that sort of aligned with your previous answer on, on the on the pool, swimming pool example. Yeah, I mean, look, I would <clears throat> I would I would say that uh, you're right, um, that you can't stop uh, customers from spilling stuff. Um, and therefore, um, again, uh, you know, in a, in a retail environment, I wouldn't be uh, suggesting to anybody that they should have, you know, anti-slip floors everywhere, and nor would HSC, I don't think, because that's not reasonable, and it's not practical. Um, but, you know, uh, would it be useful to understand the slip resistance of your floors? Well, I think it would, um, but it would particularly be useful in um, the, the entrances and the toilets and the places that are more routinely going to get wet. Um, where you've got areas that are routinely dry, but they're, suffer they're going to suffer from spillages and things like that, you know, I would be focusing uh, more on cleaning and maintenance and particularly spillage control and things like that. And, and for example, you know, if there's a spillage, make sure you leave the floor dry. So don't get a mop out and mop <clears throat> a big area where someone spilled something on the floor and actually make the problem, turn the problem from a sort of five pence piece to a meter square. Um, get some blue roll out and dry the floor. So there's very, there are very, some very basic things that you know, people can improve upon. Um, I mean, I was in um, Blue Water Shopping Centre <clears throat> just before the pandemic and somebody spilled something and they were great. They were really on it. They were really quick. They put some signs up. They mopped up the area. They got the blue roll out. They dried the floor thoroughly. As soon as the floor was dry, signs are off. And then everyone went back, to, you know, and that, that, that avoided accidents just through good process um don't hold me to this but i seem to remember when we did a campaign on, on slips and trips i seem to recall that a, a wet floor in to commas that was that was mopped took about seven or eight minutes to dry whereas if you dried it with blue roll it took about two minutes yeah that would, that would so, yeah that would sound about right <clears throat> yeah so so you know i've seen it you know everybody drag the mop around um turn a turn a pound coin size spillage into, a, into a, a square and then put the wet sign at the side of it. Well, the, yeah. the wet sign was there. Well, wet signs aren't, you know, as you alluded to in, in, your, in your presentation, you can't, you can't just put a wet sign out and then say, well, it's your fault because you didn't, you know, you didn't follow the, the, the signage. Right. I mean, signage is, is, <clears throat> is something that, that, that most places get wrong. Um, you know, you, you should use a sign and, and going back to the, the stand, I mean, look up the Stanley May uh, case, you know, and see what um, Sarah Jane Brown, who's an Irish member, Cornwall Council, uh, I'm going to have her, have her on my podcast in a couple of weeks, actually, so we're going to delve into this a bit more, but look what she said about signage, you know, signage alone is not an adequate control, uh, and, and summarising, if a floor is wet, you should preclude access from it, putting a sign up isn't precluding access, uh, or if it's wet, it should be safe to walk on when it's wet, how do you know it's safe to walk on, uh, that's where a slip test can come in. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, if you're putting a wet sign out, then then don't just leave it there all day. We've all yeah. been into, um, shall we say, some fast food outlets where you go in and the, the wet sign's um, laid on the floor, it's on its side. Uh, yeah, it becomes more of a risk. And then it becomes a tripping risk, so, so yeah. Go yeah, and, 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 uh, and people just become desensitised to them as well because they see them, you know, I, I remember sitting in a train station in London on a bright sunny day and there was a a wet football sign in the middle of the floor. It hadn't rained for days. Uh, perhaps there'd been a spillage, but it was just, it was there and the floor was bone dry and you just, everyone just walked past it. Nobody takes any care or because they just, because they're there all the time, people uh, ignore them, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is, a, the, if people's doing slips and trips presentation, there is a really um, a good one. I think it shows you a swimming pool and it, it's, there's a, there's a, a, a wet floor sign floating. Floating, yeah. Oh yeah, so that's always a good, a good one. Um, so though, you know, thank you for indulging me in those. Those are uh, ones that I used to get asked regularly. Um, so I'm going to the, some of the questions now from the um, the hard hitting questions now from the audience. The hard hitting <laughs> questions, yes. Um, should there be a focus on at the design stage in preventing slips and trips rather than looking at best practice afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that has moved on a lot in the last 10 years. Um, so a lot more architects are now more aware of slip testing and they're also aware of the fact that they need to think about um, the life cycle of, of, of the building in terms of safety. So again, I did a podcast interview with an architect and we, we went into this. So it's not just 
you know, is it safe, but is it cleanable? Is it maintainable? Will it actually, you know, remain safe for the, for the period of, of the life of the building? Um, so absolutely, that is uh, really important. Knowledge is better than it was. There's still a way to go. Um, but, you know, I would, uh, one of the key, you know, to me, there are seven uh, key times to get a slip test. And one of them is when you're specifying the floor. Um, so, you know, before you even think about choosing the floor, you should be doing that risk assessment process and figuring out what level of slip resistance do we want and then choosing the appropriate floor uh, for the for the area. So, yes, yeah, so I fun fundamentally agree with with that. And um, I do a number of um, similar presentations to this, like CPD stuff for architects, but also for like internal design teams within companies. So, you know, if anybody would like me to help with that, I'm always happy to do so. Yeah, I know the HSC did a few years ago, they, they sort of said that they were going to start going for the designers. Um, I've not seen much enforcement action. I think that was, before, uh, that was before all their funding disappeared, wasn't it? <clears throat> uh, that's perhaps another webinar, isn't it? Um, <laughs> the pendulum test, does, does that take into account um, the, the weight of the person or the speed that the person's walking? So um, the pendulum test basically simulates um, a person of, um, I can't remember the age, but it's a sort of a, an average age, an average weight, an average speed. You know, it, it's, it's trying to give an average. Uh, the, the, the rubber sole that's used, there are two types. One is a, a shod. Uh, to mimic a shod foot, one is a bare foot. So again, it's kind of av average this, average that. Um, but so that's where, you know, if, if you've got things like people that are w moving more far at more, more, at more speed, uh, or if they're pu pulling, pushing, twisting, turning, you know, the requirement for friction increases. Uh, if you've got slopes, the requirement for friction increases, um, et cetera. Uh, footwear obviously plays a role as well. Uh, there are ways of testing um, the slip resistance of footwear. Um, there's a HSL, uh, HSC, HSL test called GRIP uh, that I recommend people use um, for that. So yeah, those those things play a role as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, someone mentioned about the anti-slip strips. So mm -hmm. you can get these these sort of <clears throat> strips um, that I suppose, they look a bit like the back of a matchbox, don't they? Yeah. I've, if those are used on stairs, can that cause more trips? So is it is it almost counterintuitive um, to put them on stairs? So can you slip on stairs is an interesting discussion. Um, my, my personal view is that it's quite difficult to slip on stairs because if you think about it, um, let me use this as a this, is, this ticket as an example, right? So when you when you walk along, you, you're striking your heel, if that's the floor, you're striking a heel like this. But when you step from a stair to downwards, you actually move your foot out, forward and back on itself, and you plant it more flatly. So you're very unlikely to slip when you're planting a foot flat unless you overstep. So where nosings come in is, is, to, uh, is to prevent the risk of, of where somebody oversteps. So you, you, you rather than catching your heel there, you catch your heel right at the edge and then you can slip. Um, so, you know, they, they, they have a benefit there, but any surface that is super grippy, and this is something that is, is, is worth thinking about when it comes to specifying floors from an architectural perspective as well. Um, anything that's super grippy can produce a trip hazard and can also produce a maintenance issue where you almost can't clean it and then it becomes not only unsightly, but it can become slippery um, over time as well. So we, we do uh, work with some stair nosing companies we get involved in in that kind of thing um there's definitely a benefit both for a safety as well as a sort of dda kind of compliance perspective and demarking the steps um but yeah probably don't go sort of too too grippy with them oh i don't know if it's just you if it's just me lee but i can't hear you can you hear me now yeah yeah, apologies. Um, yeah, sorry to everyone. We, we've we've run out of time, unfortunately. We've got I know we've got questions in in the Q and A uh, that we've we've just simply run out of time. And uh, what we will do is we'll collate those questions afterwards, and we'll we've got your registration details with IOSH uh, with the people that did register. So what we'll do, we'll endeavour to get the answers to the people individually follow, following uh, following the presentation. 
So, so thank you for everybody that, that's put the questions in there. Um, as I said at the beginning, this will be recorded and hosted on the IOSH YouTube channel. Uh, Christian, are your slides going to be available? Yeah, happy to happy to do that. Um, it, you know, if anybody's got any burning questions, then they can always reach out to me on LinkedIn or email or whatever as well. But yeah, I'm happy to share the slides. And to be honest, what I could do, Lee, if you like, is um, uh, if there's a list of questions, I could do a video covering my responses to them, and we can we can circulate that. That'd be that'd be excellent. Thank you. And you'd host that on your LinkedIn page, would you? Yeah, yeah. Do whatever. Yeah. Right, perfect. Um, so that's it. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we, we, we've got loads and loads of questions. I can see lots of engagement in the chat, lots of questions. Um, so I do apologise that we ran out of time. We could have probably uh, turned this into a, a two-hour session. Maybe it's one for a podcast in the future, Christian. Exactly. Um, I'm still waiting for you to come on, Lee, you know? Oh, well, yeah. I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> um, so that's it. I'd, I'd just like to wrap up today uh, and thank, thank everybody for registering. We had just shy of 600 uh, people registered. Um, which, which is phenomenal. Um, we had some great engagement in the chat. I can see the chat's going crazy in, in, the, in the bottom corner. Uh, lots of engagement in the questions. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to wrap up. Um, thank you again, Christian, for doing that. And thank you for, for coming to our, uh, the, the face-to-face -face, uh, sem seminar that we had uh, probably two years ago now, maybe, maybe mm. more. Yeah. Um, ho hopefully we'll get you along to another one of those. Uh, but, but really appreciate on behalf of uh, IS Logistics and Retail, thank you for, for taking time out to do this. Anybody wants to reach out to Christian, he's on LinkedIn. Anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm on LinkedIn. And if you've not done so already, please give us a follow on iOS Logistics and Retail on LinkedIn. Um, so that formally ends today's webinar. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Have a great day. Cheers. Thanks.